Good morning. Welcome to Bethany Lutheran in Warren, Oregon on this first Sunday of Advent. The gospel for today is Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In Ann Tyler's novel, The Amateur Marriage, we witness a sad series of events. The book's main characters are Michael and Pauline a pair of World War II era sweethearts who get married and eventually have three children. But then one day their oldest child, Lindy, just disappears. She runs away from home and promptly falls off the face of the earth. For the first few days, weeks, and even months, they watch for her return. They seize on any and every clue as to her whereabouts. They pace, they peer out windows, they listen for a key scratching at the front door's lock. They sit bolt upright in bed each time they think they hear footfalls on the driveway. But Lindy does not return. Over the years, her absence becomes just another part of life. They never finally give up on the idea that they would see her again, but they stop watching for her. At first, they were certain she would be back soon. They would not have been at all surprised if she had walked back through that door. Years later, though, the surprise flipped. After a while, they would have been surprised if she had come back. At the time our gospel passage was written, people were beginning to lament over how long they had been waiting for Jesus to return. They wondered if they should keep waiting. And so Matthew wrote about the need to keep watching for the second coming of Jesus. He compares the second coming with the time of Noah. In verse 38, we read that in the days before the flood, they, that is anyone except Noah and his family were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. In other words, they were focused on living out their lives. Now, that does not sound all that bad to me. So I went back to the book of Genesis to check out the scripture text about Noah. It reads, When the Lord saw that man's wickedness was widespread on the earth, and that every scheme his mind thought of was nothing but evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Then the Lord said, I will wipe off the face of the earth, mankind who I created, along with the animals, creatures that crawl, and birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. Noah, however, found favor in the sight of the Lord. These are the family records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God. And Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with wickedness. God saw how corrupt the earth was, for every creature had corrupted its way on the earth. Then God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to every creature, for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Therefore, I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. Now, I had always pictured this scene like a Cecil B. DeMille movie. You know the kind. All the people have evil, lascivious looks on their faces and they're gyrating in a seductive dance, totally lost to the dark side. However, the Hebrew word used here for wickedness can mean injustice. And the Hebrew word used here for corrupt can mean bring to ruin or to destroy. And isn't that what we see happening now? We do have a large minority of Christians throughout the world. However, the majority worship other gods or no God because they are too busy with their daily lives to worry about that. Most poor people and ultra wealthy people can tell you that the justice system is designed to keep the, to be unjust to those without or with limited means. Throughout the world, we see inadequate housing, high unemployment, wages well below the cost of living, polluted air, water, and soil, slavery, sex trafficking, abuse, neglect, corruption in government and in the church, anything goes in the name of feeling good. Yes, I think we have injustice, ruin, and destruction covered. We've seen plenty of false prophets, wars and rumors of wars, and persecution of believers. We have seen the sun and the moon darken and falling pieces of stars. Yet how many of us wake up each morning thinking, maybe today will be the day Jesus shows up? In the Ann Tyler novel mentioned above, Lindy returns eventually, although her mother Pauline does not live to see it. When Lindy shows up, her father says to her, your mother never gave up hope I could tell. Of course, Pauline had gotten on with life, but she just had a way of glancing out the windows to let you know that hope was still there. When she had the chance to take a cruise with a group of friends, she refused. She came up with a dozen excuses, but everyone knew deep down the real reason was that she didn't want to be gone, just in case Lindy came back. Jesus wants us to stay alert and be looking for him, be prepared for him every day. We know he will come again. He said so. We do not know his timing, and I think that's a good thing. I found that I got much more done in my home when I worked outside the home than when I was unemployed. If I knew my time was limited, I would get right to the chores at hand, knowing I could not do them later. However, when I was home all day, I just got lazy. After all, I can do the work tomorrow. It will still be there. If we knew the exact day and time of Jesus' second coming, it would be so easy to say, ah, I have a few years left. I'll start witnessing next year. And I'll give up gambling after that next big win. I got plenty of time yet. I will get faithful about daily devotions in another year or two. And none of it would ever happen. We would fall deeply into our ungodly pattern and keep stalling on our good intentions until it was too late. From Matthew's perspective, if we do not know when the second coming will occur, we cannot wait until the time is near in order to prepare for it. We need to be ready now. Jesus equates our waiting period to knowing that a thief was coming. If we knew, we would lock our doors and windows and we would stay awake in anticipation. 
Well, God reveals enough about the future to give us hope, but not so much that we do not have to live and walk by faith day after day. This waiting is similar to applying for permission to immigrate to a new country. Sometimes it takes years before a family gets their visas approved. Now, they do not know when they will come through, so they wait in anticipation. However, they do not just sit while they wait. They continue to go to work and go to school and visit with neighbors and extended family and do household chores. They may read up about the new country, learn the language, and practice new customs from their future home. We too need to be faithful in our everyday lives, serving our Lord while we wait for his return. We eat and drink, work and play. We also go to church, read the Bible, share the good news with others, and pray to stay in communication with our Savior. We may not live until his second coming, but we will live for him in confidence and anticipation that we will live with him when we die. Let us pray. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.